Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 348. Today we're going to be working on applying direct proofs to sets. Set proofs there. Now you might notice uh, I've sort of changed my format a little bit again. No, I didn't grow my hands. They actually are the same size. But given the fact that I'm quickly running out of Sharpies and printer paper, I uh, ended up having to use a regular pen and just zooming in on the paper a lot more. So hopefully this is still pretty readable. Um, I feel like it, it seems fine. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes for a little bit. All right. So set proofs, what we're just going to do is we're going to practice some more direct proofs, but we're going to be working with sets. So if you're still having trouble with direct proofs, I would look back at that video just to refresh yourself with the structure of a direct proof. Basically, we start off by, uh, we're trying to prove a uh, if-then statement or a, a conditional statement. So we start by assuming the uh, if side, the whatever P is, and then we try to show that Q is true by applying definitions, theorems, and stuff like that. So the first example I want to look at is <clears throat> so the first example I want to look at is one that we've already covered a little bit, but I want to show what an actual proof of this looks like. So the theorem I want to show is Z is a subset of Q. So what I'm saying here, oh, that is ugly. So the first theorem I want to show is that the set of all integers is a subset of the set of all rational numbers. So what this is saying is that every integer is also a rational number. Now we talked about this a little bit before, where I was trying to show that, let's say we have some integer, I'm going to just say four, for example. And remember that in order to show that a rational number is, well, rational, we have to show that that number is equal to a fraction of two integers where those integers have no common factors uh, defined by both of those integers not being divisible by the same natural number other than one. And um, we also need to show that the denominator is not zero. So what I did in the past was we said that four is equal to four divided by one. And then we went through and said, okay, well, one is not equal to zero, so that's fine. And four and one are not divisible by the same common factor. So they're not divisible by any natural number other than one. So this is totally fine. You can take another example, negative uh, 22 which equals negative 22 divided by one. One does not equal to zero and 20, negative 22 and one are not divisible by the same common factor other than, are not divisible by the same common factors. So again, we're totally fine here. So from these examples, you might see the direction that we're going to try to take with this proof, where basically we're going to take a look at our integer and say, okay, well, that integer is equal to the integer divided by one. Obviously, they're both going to be integers. One is not going to be equal to zero, and you can't have a natural number other than one divided into one anyway. So that's all going to work very nicely. So let's take a look at what the, what the scratch work for this proof might look like. So I, so I immediately want to point out that by definition of subset, when we say that the set A is a subset of B, what that means is that for every X in whatever universe we're looking at, X being in A implies that X is in B. And this we, we say that this is true if A is a subset of B. The reason why I want to point that out is because up here, we don't have an if-then statement for our theorem, at least not directly. Now I said that a direct proof has, we have to tackle a uh, if-then statement when we're using a direct proof, and that's completely true. So what we have to do is we have to take this and we have to convert it into an if-then statement or into a conditional in order for us to even use a direct proof. 
The reason why is because we need to know what assumptions we have to make in order to try to prove the uh, conclusion we're trying to reach. So if we take this definition of a subset right here, what we can get is we can basically substitute in Z for A and Q for B. So we'll say that if we show uh, for all X, X being in the integers implies X is a rational number. If we show that this is true, then we show that the integers are a subset of the rational numbers by definition of subset. So that's what our proof is going to be. Our proof is going to focus on showing this part. And then we can say, by definition of subset, this means that the integers are a subset of the rational numbers. And the way we can do that, since we have a for all proof right here, we're going to use our arbitrary x like we did in the last proof. So what we'll say is we'll let x be an integer. And then based off of what we did in our examples here, we'll note that x equals x divided by 1. So let x be an integer. x equals x divided by 1. Now what we have to do is we have to make sure that the definitions of a rational number are fulfilled. So need to show, what we need to show is that one is not equal to zero, x and one are both in the integers, <clears throat> and no natural number greater than one divides evenly into both x and 1. These first two points are trivial, so we'll be able to say that pretty easily. And this part right here, we'll have to note that we'll note that no natural number greater than 1 divides evenly into 1. So because of that, no natural number divides evenly into both x and 1, which means that x and 1 have no common factors. So We'll have to make that note when we're going through our proof right there. And once we show all of this, then x is a rational number. We can make this claim once we show that x has this equivalency that we can make this claim once. So then once we show all of these requirements, we know that x is equal to some fract some reduced fraction which means that x is a natural number. And because of that, we can then say, therefore, by definition of rational number, uh, sorry, by definition of subset, z is a subset of q. So that's what we're going to be showing in the proof. And I will write that up and I will walk through that, walk through what a good proof of this would look like. All right, so what I have here is I have the entire proof written out. So I want to go through step by step and talk about why I, you know, why I write certain things and why I choose the order that I put them in. So the first thing I want to point out is a part of the reason why I really emphasize the fact that we should be using our scratch paper like this is because we actually have this really nice list of what we need to show. We have a list of things that we need to prove in order to show that the theorem is true. So because we have this nice list, we actually have we actually know what we need to work towards in the proof. So if I had just shown you this proof without going through my uh, scratch work like this, you might be wondering, well, why did I start out with this sentence here as like the third sentence in the proof? Or, why am I talking about this whole common factors thing? So that's why I like to talk about the scratch work, and that's why I think it's so important for this type of work here. Anyway, so what the proof is, is I start out by making our assumption we're going to let x be an integer. 
And remember, I'm making this assumption because I'm trying to show that x being an integer implies that x is a rational number. And then we can use our definition of subsets in order to show that, well, since this works for all x, given that we've used an arbitrary x like this, this means that we can apply our definition of the subset there. So I start off by saying, let x be an integer, and immediately say, note that x equals x over 1. So I'm already setting up the definition of rational numbers right here. And then I've I make sure that everything, all the conditions of the definition of rational numbers are met. So I immediately start out by, by saying that 1 is an integer, because a rational number, both x and 1, actually need to be integers here. That's a major requirement for that. I also point out that 1 is not equal to 0. Uh, debatably, we don't really have to say that, so I probably would have been fine not saying it, but it's nice to have that like explicit check mark that says, OK, well, we know that this part of the definition of rational numbers is satisfied. Um, probably you're fine if you don't put this one, because it's pretty, I would, I would say it counts as common knowledge that 1 is not 0. Then I'll make this argument. Note that x cannot share any common factors with 1 other than 1. And because of that, we've satisfied all three parts of the definition of rational numbers, so we can say that x is a rational number, which means that this works for any integer x that we put in. So I could say, I could put in x is 4 here, x is negative 22, x is 100,432, etc., etc. So I landed this conclusion that x is a rational number. And then I can say, therefore, by definition of subset, we can, we can apply that definition right here and say that the integers are a subset of the rational numbers. So that's what that proof looks like. And of course, I draw the little box at the end. Um, again, you know, feel free to draw whatever you want as long as it's some kind of happy symbol. I think the, I think the most unusual QED end of the proof symbol I've seen is uh, someone went and drew a blobfish at the end of every single proof they drew, even for the midterms, which was uh, really shows some dedication. So I uh, I really appreciate when people get creative with this. It makes my it makes my job a little fun. All right, so here's our next theorem. We're going to let A and B be sets. A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now this one's a little bit of a doozy, so what I want to do actually is break this up into propositional logic as part of the scratch work and see if we can figure out how to approach this problem a little bit easier. But first, why don't we uh, take a look at a quick example? So let's let A equal the set 1, 2, and 3. B be the set 1, 2, and 3, and C be the set 1, 2, 3, and 4, like so. So if we look at this using A and B, A clearly equals B because they have the exact same elements here. So A equals B. We also have that if an element is an A, it also shows up in B. So we have A as a subset of B. And if an element is in B, it is also clearly in A because they have the same elements. So B is a subset of A right here. So combining these two with the truth, or so combining these two with a conjunction, rather, we'll have uh, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. This whole thing is equivalent to true. A equals B is equivalent to true, which means that A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. This whole thing is true. And remember, with an if and only if, this entire statement is true if this is true and this is true, or if this is false and this is false. In this case, these both are true, so the whole statement is true. Now, let's take a look at what happens when we look at A and C. So A clearly doesn't equal C because C has this extra element in here. So A and C don't have 
all the same elements. We have that A is a subset of C, but C is not a subset of A. So when we look at A is a subset of C and C is a subset of A, this statement right here, because this negation is true, this thing is going to be false. So the whole conjunction is false, like so. The statement A equals C is also equivalent to false because we know that A is not equal to C. So if we take A equals C if and only if A is a subset of C and C is a subset of A, this is false, this is false. So false if and only if false is actually true. So the statement holds up no matter what's happening here. So hopefully examples like this uh, convince you of why this theorem actually should make sense. But let's take a look at the scratch trick right here and see how we can decompose this into a statement that we can prove somewhat easily, hopefully. Because right now we don't have any uh, if statements as is. And again, the only proving tool that we have is a direct proof, which requires a uh, if-then statement. So Let's work on that. Let's uh, let's flex our logical equivalency knowledge. Okay, so what I've done is I have converted our theorem into propositional logic. So P is going to be the statement A equals B. Q is the statement A is a subset of B. And R is the statement B is a subset of A. So our theorem becomes, as I've written up here, P if and only if Q and R. Now, what we want to do is we want to use our logical equivalencies to convert this into things that we can actually prove. So I think the first thing we can immediately do, um, and I'll put this in parentheses for clarity, is we have an if and only if, and we know how we can convert this immediately into uh, two conditionals using the uh, bijection conditional, uh, I'm sorry, using the biconditional conjecture equivalency. So this would be equivalent to P if, uh, if P then Q and R and if Q and R then P. This is by B, C, E. And what this means is that if we want to prove that our theorem here is true, we can prove two conditionals right here. If we show that both of these are true, then we show that this is true. And the two conditionals, what we're going to do is we're going to first assume that A equals B and then show that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. And then we're also going to show that A is a subset of B. If we assume A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, then we can show that, then we wanna prove that A equals B. So what we're doing here, in order to solve our if and only if statement, we're actually solving two if statements in order to prove this. So I'll show you how, to, how we can handle that. But whenever you see an if and only if in a proof, and this is important, whenever you see an if and only if in a proof, what you want to do is you actually want to decompose that into two if statements. So this actually applies not just for direct proofs, but for any type of proof, you want to decompose it into if statements, into two if statements. All right, so let's take a look at the if statements we're trying to prove here. The first, I'm going to label the first with a right facing arrow. The first is that A equals B implies A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. The second, which I'll denote with a leftward facing arrow, is the statement a is a subset of B and B is a subset of A implies A equals B. So let's take a look at what these actually are trying to show because we, we can make this a little bit more clear by actually talking about the definition of set equality and subset. So what we're trying to show for this right here is, I'm going to draw an arrow down this way. What we're trying to show is that 
for all x, x in A, x is in A if and only if x is in B, this whole thing is true. If this whole thing is true, excuse my voice crack there, it's very late at night, then this implies that for all x, x being in A implies x is in B, and for all x, x being in B implies x is in A. And what we can actually do here is we can take this for all x and sort of bring it out to the front. So that's what I'll do right here. This whole thing is equivalent to saying for all x, x in A, if and only if x is in B, this whole thing implies x is in A, if, if x is in A, then x is in B, and if x is in B, then x is in A. So this looks, a, now this is kind of a mess of propositional logic, but what you can see right here is we actually have a uh, biconditional equivalency but what we actually have right here is a biconditional conjunction equivalency ready to be set up. So what this really becomes is for all x, x is in A if and only if x is in B implies x is in A if and only if x is in B. So we can already see sort of the equivalency right here. But the reason why I want to talk about this is I want to see how we're going to approach this problem right here. So what we can do is we can start out by saying, okay, well, we'll assume A equals B. Then that means that for all X, X is in A, if and only if X is in B, apply our biconditional conjunction equivalency and then say that means X is in A implies X is in B and X is in B implies X is in A which by definition of subset means X is a, a is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So this is sort of the direction that we're going here, is we're going to show this propositional argument using logic. So we'll take a look at what that looks like in a sec. Um, the other thing I want to do is I want to talk about this argument here. So this one, we're going to start out by assuming A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, which means that, do I want to include this? We can apply our definitions to show for all x, x is in A implies x is in B, and for all x, x is in B implies x is in A. That whole thing implies for all x, x is in A if and only if x is in B. And really we can do the same thing as above to get something similar, but with these uh, sort of reversed. So this would be for all X, X is in A implies X is in B and X is in B implies X is in A. That whole conjunction implies X is in A if and only if X is in B. Now this might seem like a lot. Uh, what I'm hoping is that once we start working through the actual proof, this will be a little bit easier to see where I'm trying to go with this. Um, but basically the idea is that we're going to start out with these assumptions right here and then show that 
well, if we make this assumption, then we can show, say, if we make this assumption, then we can show this, which then means that they are equivalent. <clears throat> so for the proof, uh, So for the proof, remember that we need to show, we need to break this uh, if and only if statement into two conditional statements. So we need to prove two things, basically. We need to prove this statement here that I labeled with the right arrow and this statement that I labeled with the left arrow. It doesn't matter what order we prove them in, as long as we prove that both of these are true. So the way we can talk about this is I'm going to write down the proof like we normally do, <clears throat> but then I'm going to put down an arrow, like so, and this will signal, hey, I'm working on the direction of the proof that is labeled with the left arrow. In this case, I'm assuming Q and R, and then trying to show P. So in order to show, so assuming Q and R, we're going to say, suppose A is a subset of B, and B is a subset of A. By definition of subset, this means for all x, x in A implies x in B, and for all x, x in B implies x in A. We'll do the same thing that we can do by sort of taking these for all x's out to the front. So then we'll say that this is equivalent to for all x, x in A implies x in B and x in B implies x in A. Then We'll apply the biconditional conjunction equivalency here to say that for all x, x is in A if and only if x is in B. And I should put an equivalency sign there. Then right here, what we basically have is the definition of A equals B. So what we can do is we can say by definition, of set equality, A equals B. So if we have what we're looking for. We can say, therefore, if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, then A equals B. So this is just the proof of the uh, sort of the left. So this is the proof of what we call the backwards direction. This is the proof that our, if I refer back to these notes, this is the proof that Q and R implies P. We still need to show that P implies Q and R in order for us to make the claim that this uh, if and only if statement is valid. So now what we need to do is what I'm, I'm not going to put a QED here yet. We only put some sort of QED symbol at the end of the entire proof. So we're not done with the entire proof. We only finished one part of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to then label the forward direction or the, uh, the right facing arrow here, and then we can get started on the next proof. But let's think about the next proof. What we're going to do is we're going to start out by saying, we'll assume X equal, let's assume A equals B, then we'll apply the definition to get for all X, X in A, X is in A, if and only if X is in B, 
then we'll apply BCE to get for all X, X is in A, it uh, implies X is in B, and X is in B implies X is in A, which is then equivalent to for all X, X is in A, implies X is in B, and X, X is in B implies X is in A. So really what we're going to end up doing is we're going to write out the exact same argument up in here, but backwards. So you could honestly, I could write out the entire thing just by reading the, all of the arguments I make in here uh, down to up. So we're going to do something really nice and convenient when we have a case like this where we have an if and only if proof that uh, basically follows the exact same logic in both halves of the proof. And I'll do, I'll do this. So we can say by a symmetric argument, Uh, and what I mean by biosymmetric argument is that we're saying that the same logic here holds up in the opposite direction. By a symmetric argument, if A equals B, then A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now you do have to be careful when you do this, you have to be absolutely sure that the argument in the previous part that you showed is actually true. You have to be 100% sure that this argument here works the other way around. In this case, I feel pretty sure about it because these are all logical equivalencies here. And we know that the logical equivalencies work both ways. So because of that, I feel confident in saying that this is true. So what we've done is we've shown the backwards direction, we've shown the forwards direction, we have both sides, which means that we know, like once we know both of these are true, then the conjunction of these is also true. So we then know that this is also true by this equivalency. So we can finish up this proof by saying, thus A equals B if and only if, a is a subset of B, and B is a subset of A. And we're fine. We're, we're done with this proof. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky proof because it's, it is an if and only if proof, but I want you to remember the techniques that we did here in order to show that this is true by solving two conditional statements. So that technique will be really important. Not only that, but this theorem right here, this theorem is one of our big important theorems that I'm actually going to ask you to use a lot. So anytime you see a theorem that says uh, prove that one set is equal to another set, the way we're going to do that is we're going to show, okay, well, let's prove that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. And my next example will actually be doing that, is uh, showing how we can solve this problem using that. So this theorem, come back to this theorem a lot. Remember this theorem, put it in a list of really important theorems. In fact, this will be one of the theorems that I, I will be, I'll, I'll talk about this more when I talk about the midterm, but this will be one of the big theorems that I will be asking you to use on the midterm. So keep that in mind. Um, hint, hint, hint. Big important theorem there. All right, well, that's it for sets proofs. Uh, the next video will be about some more cool tricks that you can use um, really in any style of proof that we do. So we'll, we'll show some direct proofs that do some cool stuff in them uh, to help make problems a little bit easier. But yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day.